Hey, and thanks for joining us for Parkview at Home. I'm Nathan, the online pastor around here, and over the next hour or so, we pray that you get to know God a little bit better. And we also pray that because of this experience, you take a step toward Him. Uh, Parkview is the kind of church where, regardless of your past or your story, uh, whether you've been in church all your life or you're exploring faith for the first time, you belong. And if at any point along the way you decide it's time to take a step toward God, we would love to hear about it. Visit parkviewchurch.com slash next steps to start a conversation with our team about those things that God is doing in your life. In a moment, we'll join our broadcast campus where the band will lead us in some songs and we'll continue our teaching series. You can quote me on that. Uh, then I'll be back toward the end to lead us in a time of communion. Enjoy the service. Why don't you stand if you're here? Let's have a great time as we sing together. Joy awaits my parade. 
God, I will praise you. Who is like the Lord, strong in battle? Who is like the Lord, mighty to save? Who is like the Lord, King forever? Jesus reigns, Jesus reigns. I know that you are always with me. Your presence goes before and goes behind. sing with you. Go ahead and grab a seat. Uh, we're going to continue to worship our great God. We're going to take a few moments now to have communion together. And it's just a chance for us to go back and remember this amazing God. Uh, hopefully when you came in, you were given a communion pack. I'm going to invite you to take those out now. Uh, if you've never used one of these before, there's two layers. There's a very thin layer on the top for that wafer. And then there's a second one for the juice. And while you figure that out, let me just, let me just take us back to what we just sang magnificent with grace unending. It's an incredible thing. You rescue us with love that never fails us. I know that you are always with me and your presence goes before and it goes behind. And it's so good to sing words like that because it reminds us of this amazing God who stepped down to earth and covered our sin and did what we could not do. And now we get to go back and just say thank you. That's an incredible thing. That's the God that we worship. Uh, scripture says that every time we eat the bread and every time we drink the cup, we are proclaiming the Lord's death until he returns. So friends, let's do that together. Let's proclaim, let's remember the body of Christ given for you. Take and eat. Now the blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for dying for our sin. Thank you for rising again. 
Thank you for being this magnificent God who was able to step into our world and save us in a way that we could not. Thank you for making us right with you and now giving us a chance to celebrate all that you are, all that you've done. We love you, God. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. And everyone said, amen.
Welcome Parkview, good to have you guys here at New Linux, good to have you at Homer Glen, good to have you at Orland, great to have you online, I'm Tim, I'm uh, one of the pastors here, uh, I'm not preaching, I'm introducing somebody today, I'm on my study break because I can get ready for the fall season and I'm excited for what God is going to do, but um, I also like to represent w- when I'm off, uh, I really like to represent diversity as best we can, you know, and, and, and so today you're going to hear from one of the top female communicators that I know, and her name is Jody Hickerson. Welcome, Jody, for me right now. Um, in a couple of weeks, my buddy Montel Jordan is going to be back, and of course, we also have really white, middle-aged Todd Clark. So we have the whole thing all packaged up for you, and I'll be back in a couple of weeks, and, and uh, we'll get rolling on a really, really strong fall, and as we get ready to go, uh, middle of uh, August is going to be at the movies. We're going to do at the movies, not Christmas now, and uh, you're going to be excited to see what we do as we get all those things going. I, I want to introduce Jody, because here's the deal with Jody. Um, my kids worked at their church. Mike and Jody uh, started Mission Church in Ventura, California. Um, a part of you helped start it. Uh, there were a couple of California churches that really were the big players in it, but uh, part of you and another Illinois church, uh, several of us all went together. I was on the management team as we got things started at Mission Church. I remember being uh, at the Ventura Marriott and getting up one morning because I was on the wrong you know, schedule in California and grabbing one of those bikes and, and riding up the coast, praying about this church that we were starting in Ventura, California. And then my uh, son-in-law, Tommy, and my daughter decided they uh, wanted to do a residency somewhere. And I'm like, oh, well, you got to go out to California, which was so dumb, wasn't it? His parents are sitting down here too. Because I don't know why we thought they would ever come back, but they didn't ever come back. And so for the last eight years, they've been out there, they've been on staff. And as it turns out, they are flying away from California to go to Nashville, like all the other people from California. They are moving like this weekend to Nashville, and Mike and Jody have had to give them up. And I, and I say all of that because, I mean, you, you didn't even know that. That's a new revelation just happened. Um, but, but, but I say that because Jody's dad and, and mom were really good people to my wife and I as we did ministry. Her dad was very inspirational to me. He was a, he's a good friend of mine and it really, really inspired me in a lot of ways. And then we helped start Mission Church and then they have been in my kid's life and, you know, my granddaughter and my grandson. And, and now they're, uh, and I just got to tell you, I got to be honest with you, it's hard to lead churches in California and Illinois right now, okay? Because people don't want to live in California and Illinois right now. I don't know if you know this or not, but it's easy to get a U-Haul to go to those places. It's hard to get a U-Haul to leave those places because that's just kind of the reality of what's going on. And we're experiencing some of that here as well. Uh, So I just want Jody to come up here right now and, and I want us to pray for them um, like they're, they're not going to miss a beat with Tommy and Lauren gone, but at the same time, this oh, yeah. is a deep relationship that we've always had together and our churches are together. So would you just put your hands out right now and let's pray for Mission Church, okay? God, I just want to thank you so much for the faith that Mike and Jody and and T.D. and Jen and Jim and his wife had to leave Rockford, Illinois all those years ago and go start this church and the amazing things that you've done in a place where if ever there was needed a, a church, it was in Ventura, California. And I love what they've done, and we will always be a part of this. And as transitions are happening, I, I know that it's tricky. I know that uh, it, it's always weird for all of us in church work right now, coming out of COVID, figuring out how things go forward. But I want to pray a blessing on this church. Our church doesn't maybe know how much we've been together in all of this, and, and I love that. And I pray for Jody as she gets a chance to speak to us today. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jody. Thank Welcome, you. Jody. Thank you, guys. Woo! Nothing like getting me teared up before I get going here um, today. I mean, it's such an honor to be here. Um, as Tim said, we are part of Mission Church in Ventura, California. And one of the reasons why, as he was speaking, uh, that I just love getting to be here is the opportunity to say thank you in person uh, to all of you. Because Parkview has been such a supporter 
of mission before it was even named mission, before it ever existed. Um, And it's just because of the generosity of people like you and the kingdom mindset to think outside of yourselves, um, that a church that I love dearly, Mission Church, will be turning 10 years old um, in a couple of months, and we get to watch and continue to watch people find hope through Jesus Christ. Uh, So on behalf of a whole bunch of people in California that you may never meet this side of heaven, thank you, thank you, thank you for your generosity and your kingdom mindset. We are just eternally grateful. Um, Well, we're continuing in this series that we've been in this summer called You Can Quote Me on That. And I love that because I kind of love, you know, movie quotes. I don't know if anyone else just talks in movie quotes. My brothers and I uh, tend to text only in, you know, movie quotes. Like if something impossible is about to go down, we're like, so you're telling me there's a chance. You know, we go dumb and dumber. Um, My youngest brother, he's only 35, but he had a double hip replacement. And so we're teasing him and he just comes back with, it's merely a flesh wound. You know, he's like, no big deal. Um, Or the easiest way to end a conversation, you just go for a scump and you say, That's all I have to say about that, right? Uh, One of my favorite movie quotes of all time um, is from this really quirky 80s movie, which I know was like before some of you were born, but please tell me you've seen The Princess Bride. Please tell me you've seen it. And if you know this quote, wherever you are, uh, say it with me. Hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. Awesome. That has nothing to do with anything that I'm teaching on. I just thought it was really fun. Uh, Because clearly we're not looking at, you know, famous movie quotes. We're looking at the words of Jesus this summer. That's what we're doing. We're looking at his words, his quotes, what his words could teach us, what it teaches us about who he was, words that show us what Jesus was like. But more than just learning about Jesus, We're learning, and I hope that you're leaning into the fact that these words have the power to reach throughout thousands of years of history and impact our lives, hit us right where we're at today. And there are a lot of amazing words and things and quotes that I could have chosen um, from Jesus to teach on this weekend. But what I want to do with our time together is just look at a story. Look, Look at a relationship And look at a conversation that that becomes a life-changing conversation. And it starts with these words, this invitation, this quote from Jesus, John 21, 12. Jesus says, now come and have some breakfast. Now, who doesn't love a guy that invites you to breakfast, okay? But what is so significant about these words and why I love this quote coming from Jesus is that he says them to a dear friend, a guy named Peter who just a few mornings before had failed Jesus big time. And so this invitation to breakfast, this is where Jesus flips the script on Peter's failure and turns it into redemption. Anybody else need redemption from failure? We all do, right? because we've all failed. Now, when it comes to failure, um, I really enjoy looking at like the Pinterest fails because I'm not super crafty and I'm not a very good baker. Um, So I really, you know, appreciate it when someone shares, you know, that the cupcakes of Cookie Monster uh, were supposed to look like this. I think we have a picture of that. Yeah, they're supposed to look like this. And, And that's great, but then they end up looking like this, and it's way more relatable, okay? That's, that's way more relatable to me. I don't know if there's any redeeming that. Um, or this mom who was hoping to surprise her kids with this cute um, little bunny, like a pancake thing. She's like, oh, I'll try that, but it, she ends up terrifying them because um, it ends up looking like this. Yeah, that's just so relatable, right? Uh, I just want to take a little survey um, here, wherever you're at, wherever you're watching from, you can wait till the end of this list, and then I just want a, a show of hands wherever you're at. If you have ever flunked a class or bombed a test, got cut from a team, really messed up an audition, got rejected for a date, zoned out during a job interview, got fired for a little goof up or a medium mishap or a huge mistake, things didn't go the way you dreamed, you lost your cool with a three-year-old, if you've ever experienced a moral, social, academic, athletic, relational, financial, marital, or vocational failure of any kind, just raise your hand, right? Bunch of losers, wow, I'm, I'm just kidding, I'm kidding, because that's all of us. 
All of us have experience with some degree of failure. And while we can look back and laugh at some of them, others we carry with us. And we keep replaying it over and over in our mind. And they rob us of peace and sleep and confidence and joy. And we don't think there's any way we could recover from the way we failed. Not from what we did. But we are not alone. And just like Peter, we have a Savior who didn't just come to save us, but actually wants to sit with us as a friend in the mess of it all, right after it all, and restore us. Before we get to this breakfast conversation, I just want to rewind, kind of talk about this relationship. Give us a little history on how Peter began following Jesus in the first place. You could read this um, on your own this week. It's in Luke chapter 5. But basically, on, on one day, Jesus was teaching, and he was teaching on a shore of this lake. And there's just such a big crowd, they keep pushing in on him. Like, he's like getting back into the water. He doesn't have any place to go. And so he notices a couple of little boats there on the water's edge and a few fishermen there that are clean cleaning their nets, and so he jumps into one of the boats, a, guy, a boat that belonged to a guy named Simon Peter, and he asked Peter, hey man, could you just take me out a little bit from shore so these people don't run over me so that I could finish my teaching? And so they take him out into the water, and he finishes um, this amazing message, and Peter's like, wow, you're, you know, really good at that. And so then Jesus looks at Peter and says, hey, you want to go out for a catch? Let's take this thing out deep and go out for a catch. And Peter is like, dude, I just clean my nets. <laughs> like, you're good at the talking thing, but we've been up all night. Like, we haven't caught anything, but I mean, you seem important. Okay, like, I'll, I'll take you out fishing, but just be, be aware. There's not going to be much luck. Well, they get out there, and they start filling up these nets so much so that they begin to break like so many fish. Peter's calling for other boats. He's like, y'all got to come help us with these fish. And they fill up these other boats so full that the boats begin to sink. And Peter is floored. Like literally, he falls on his face before Jesus. And he is just like, I don't deserve to be in your presence. I am a sinful man. Like you're the Lord. And Jesus says, man, don't be afraid. I got in your boat on purpose. Follow me. And you'll fish for people. I'll help you rescue people. You want to be a part of something real? You want to be a part of pulling people out of the depths? And so Peter left everything. And he followed Jesus. And for three years, he traveled with Jesus. He got to know Jesus. He got to be a part of offering that real hope to people. He got to be a part of miracles he never dreamed of. He saw Jesus heal people who were sick, lame, blind, tormented, afflicted. He heard almost every word that came out of Jesus' mouth. They laughed together. They stayed up late and talked. They prayed together. They ate countless meals together. They were so close. He was part of his inner circle. Jesus even nicknamed Peter the Rock, like long before Dwayne Johnson. And he told him, like, I'm going to use you to be a huge part of reaching countless people for the kingdom of God. I mean, talk about an adventure from Jesus getting into his boat. And you fast forward on the night before Jesus is crucified. He's there with his friends and he's explaining what's about to happen to him. It says in Mark 14, on the way, Jesus told them, all of you will desert me. For the scriptures say, God will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Now, just to push pause for a moment, because we see this terminology of shepherd and sheep a lot of times in the Bible. That might be new to you. We're going to come back to it today. So I just want to be clear that it's describing Jesus as our good shepherd and us people. We are the sheep. So Jesus is telling them, guys, it's about to go down. And when they strike me, when they come for me, when they arrest me, when they put me on trial and whip me and crucify me and kill me, all y'all are going to run. You're going to scatter. You're going to bolt. You're going to fall away. But after I am raised from the dead, I will go ahead of you to Galilee and meet you there. And Peter said to him, even if everyone else deserts you, I never will. Peter is like, hold on, no way. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know who these other sheep are, but not me. 
Not a chance. Even if everybody else runs away, I will not run. I'm not going to bail on you, Jesus. These other guys might, but not me. I'm the rock. I got your back. And Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, Peter. This very night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny three times that you even know me. No, Peter declared emphatically. Even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And all the others vowed the same. I like that little add-on because Peter's so passionate. I imagine him yelling like, no way. And all the others are like, yeah, yeah, us too. You know, yeah, me too. But I think this is such an important conversation to see between Peter and Jesus before Peter fails because he says words that I think so many of us often say before we fail. He says, I will never. Not me. I would never do that. And maybe you've learned this principle the hard way like I have, that pride comes before a fall. That it's when we get arrogant, when we put our guard down, when we stop being anchored to the truth, when we start feeling like we're immune or we're invincible, or we start to look at other people who have fallen and we think, man, I w- even if they do that, I would never do that. And we look at them with judgment instead of our hearts being broken for them. Listen, we got to stay humble and dependent on God because pride, the I never will, comes before a fall. Well, right after this conversation, soldiers come to arrest Jesus. And Peter, with all of his, you know, I will die for you gusto, he takes out his sword and he cuts off the ear of one of the messengers that's there in the army. Like, literally picture this. He goes after like the one unarmed dude, okay? Like, here's the surgeon. He's like, messenger, I'm taking you down. You know, he cuts off his ear. And Jesus is like, really? Really? Come on, man. Don't you think I have the power to call down legions of angels and stop this whole thing? Like, put your sword away, okay? And he actually picks up the ear and heals the dude's ear on his way to trial. Can you imagine? Could you uncuff me for a minute? Yeah, let me just heal this guy. And now I'll go on my way to be arrested. Well, John and Peter, they follow behind. Because now Jesus is heading to trial. And John, he's got some inside connections. So he gets them into the courtyard where they could be close and kind of hear the trial. And there was a woman there, and she looked at Peter. And the woman asked Peter, you're not one of that man's disciples, are you? No, he said, I'm not. Well, because it was cold, the household servants and the guards had made a charcoal fire, and they stood around it, warming themselves. And Peter stood with them, warming himself. Meanwhile, as Simon Peter was standing by the fire, warming himself, they asked him again, hey, you're not one of his disciples, are you? And he denied it, saying, no, I'm not. But one of the household slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, didn't I see you out there in the olive road with Jesus? This girl's like, hold on, I never forget a face, especially one that cut off my cousin's ear, okay? Like, I know you are out there. I know you're one of his followers. And it says again, Peter denied it and immediately a rooster crowed. In the book of Mark, we get a little more detail about this exact moment because Mark interviewed Peter to get the account of the story. And so Peter actually tells us that he began to call down curses and swear on this third time that he had nothing to do with Jesus. And as I've studied that, I've learned that this was more than just like, I swear on my mother's grave or, you know, I don't bleep and know the man. No, what this is talking about is Peter was cursing Jesus. He was out there around the fire saying things about Jesus in a way so that people would think, well, there's no way that a follower of his would talk about him that way. And one of the most heartbreaking things about this moment, as Peter is going off and saying all this stuff, is that Jesus is being moved through the courtyard for the next trial. And Luke tells us that at that moment, the Lord turned and guess he looked at Peter. And suddenly the Lord's words flash through Peter's mind before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny three times that you even know me. And Peter left the courtyard weeping bitterly because Peter did what he thought, what he said, what he promised he would never do. 
And then he locked eyes with the one who loved him, who he had betrayed. And he went out and he wept bitterly. A few days later, we find Peter back with the other guys. And he wants to go fishing. Right? He's like, let's go back to what I knew before. Because he really believed in his mind, there's no way I'm going back to being used by God again. And so they all jumped in the boat and they head out on the Sea of Tiberias. Now, I, I just want to push pause for a moment here because I want you to picture it. The boat itself is stable, but Peter is sinking. Peter is drowning in a sea of regret. He is replaying that night, what he did, the awful things he said over and over again, right? Like we do sometimes. He's asking himself, how in the world could I have done that? And I'm guessing as he floats out in that little fishing boat that every time he stares out at the horizon, he's replaying that moment, standing in front of that fire, looking through the smoke into the eyes of his best friend Jesus, and he just feels so worthless and so embarrassed about it and so ashamed that he did it. And if he could only do it over. And as he floats, you know, on this sea of regret, he's just sinking fast. You ever been there? I think every one of us have floated in a boat called failure. And maybe because we thought we were unsinkable. Some of you may be there right now and you feel so deflated and so ashamed and so embarrassed and you wonder if you're ever going to resurface. If you've had those thoughts like, I can't believe I did this or I've ruined everything or I broke my vows or I destroyed the relationship or I've lost my reputation or I'm such a fake or my kids are never going to speak to me again or I've lost my parents' trust. I've betrayed my best friends. I've really broke the heart of God. Is there any way to resurface? Is there any way to rise above my embarrassment, my remorse, my guilt, my shame, my regret? Is there any hope for me? And the answer is absolutely. Because we have a God who specializes in, in flipping the script from failure to redemption. And I can tell you from personal experience today that he can take the messiest waste of our lives and turn it into fertile soil to grow something new, to grow something good. And we see this in Peter. I actually think there's a few things that Peter did right in his failure, that hold true for all of us. The first thing is this, he was wrecked by failure and he owned it. Peter was not flippant about what he had done. He was wrecked by it. It wrecked his heart. He knew he was wrong. And listen, there is amazing beginning of freedom in those words, I was wrong. Peter owned it. You guys, we can't blame our way to freedom. We got to own it. He admitted his failure and he was broken by it. The once proud rock is now like this little pile of rubble. And I love that about Peter. I love that he wept bitterly. I love that he was repentant, that it really broke his heart. Have you ever been broken over your sin, over your stuff, over your failures, over your rebellion and running from God, really broken, not upset that you got caught? Or not miserable because there's some consequences, but genuinely humble and remorseful. It's James 4.10 that says, if we do humble ourselves before the Lord, he will lift us up. That's because there is nothing in the heart of God that wants you to stay down when you fall down. He just wants you to humble yourself so that he can pick you back up. Peter owned it. And God gets us back up when we humble ourselves and own it. Peter was also wrecked over humiliation, but he stayed in the group. We find Peter fishing in that boat after a pretty public failure. After he's pretty publicly said, I will never. He's not alone. He's hanging with his friends. Peter climbs in this boat with James, John, Thomas, Nathaniel, and a couple others. There's seven of them that went fishing, which made me think how all of us need some good friends who have been in the same boat, don't we? that will be there with us. Peter was wise enough to stay in the group. In fact, right after he admitted his failure and wept bitterly about it, we find him right back in the group, hiding out in the upper room with the rest of the guys, even though he was a mess. I'm sure he didn't want to show his face. And didn't we all admit just a few minutes ago that we've all failed, that we're all in the same boat, that we all need the grace of God? It's one of the reasons why I love the heartbeat of this church so much. There's no perfect people allowed here. 
We all need the grace of God and we all need one another. And it's so important for us to surround ourselves with good people who know what it's like to fall and get back up and can point us to real hope and can be there for us. In fact, when you look at the text, it was Peter who said, I'm going fishing. And the rest of them responded with, we'll go too. There's power in having some people like that. And you know what? Sometimes I'll run into people that I haven't seen, like, in church in a while. And I'll be like, hey, man, where you been? Like, oh, we've just been going through a really hard time. And I just want to say that's what we're here for. That's why we show up. That's why we need each other. We don't just do church, come to church. We are the church for one another. Don't let failure isolate you. A lot of us begin to think, after what I've done, there's no way I'm going to show my face there again. No, you're wrong. When it comes to needing the grace of God, we're all in the same boat, so stay in the group. Maybe you've thought, I have no place in a worship service after the things I've done. No, you're wrong. Stay in the group. I'm too embarrassed to show back up to my group. No, you're wrong. Stay in the group, especially after this past year and a half. We all were isolated, and it's so easy to keep that as a habit. No, stay in the group. Keep showing up. Go back to your AA meetings. Go back to what you were doing before. Reach out to someone. Ecclesiastes 4.10 says if one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But people who are alone when they fall, they're in real trouble. We all fall down. So stay in the group. And then we see that even though Peter was wrecked, with shame. He still swam to Jesus. So they're all out on the boat and they're fishing. It doesn't say if they're catching. I don't think they're catching much. And it's been my experience too. I can do fishing. I haven't done much catching. Um, but all of a sudden they hear someone from the shore. And they look but they don't recognize him. He says, hey, you caught anything? They're like, no, thanks for pointing that out, you know. And he says, throw your nets to the other side. And so they did. And they were unable to haul in the net because there were so many fish. Does this sound familiar? Jesus is recreating the moment where he called Peter to follow him and told him that he was going to use his life to bring hope to people. And Jesus is saying in this big time illustration, you are not done yet. I'm calling you again. Even after it all, I want you. I want you. Well, John gets a clue. And he turns to Peter and he says, it's the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his tunic, he jumped into the water, and he headed to shore. The others stayed with the boat and pulled the loaded net to shore, for they were only about 100 yards from shore. When they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them. Fish cooking over a charcoal fire and some bread. It's hilarious to me that John kind of subtly roasts Peter in this because he describes that Peter, you know, puts on his shirt and jumps into the water and just starts swimming. And he's like, the rest of us just stayed in the boat because we were only like 100 yards from shore. So he's kind of like, we, we probably beat him, okay? He's just frantically beside the boat. But he had to jump in. He had to get to Jesus. Bring some of the fish you've just caught, Jesus said. So Simon Peter went aboard and he dragged the net to shore. There's 153 large fish, and yet the net hadn't torn. Now come have some breakfast, Jesus said. Jesus knows what Peter's done. He knew it before he did it. And beyond that, Jesus knows what Peter's feeling and how he is sinking. And there Jesus is, not with, ha, I told you so, told you that rooster thing. Not, not so much of a rock now, huh? No, that's not Jesus. Jesus is fixing him breakfast. And he says, hey, man, get over here. Come sit with me. What a friend we have in Jesus. And I love that it's breakfast. Because their last meal together was supper. And Peter said, I will never. And that was the night that Peter failed. But now it's a new day. It's a dawn. It's kind of the picture of good night failure, good morning redemption. 
Good night, shame, good morning, grace. And I don't know if you walked in here or wherever you're at or you logged on today wrecked by shame or carrying some kind of shame. And you feel like maybe you just didn't do something wrong, but now like you are something wrong. You've started to believe that. Listen, shame can be a dangerous enemy to our souls, telling us we're never going to recover. We're never going to get back up. We're back to square one. We haven't made any progress. This is just who we are. I've been there. But shame has an even powerful enemy to it, and that's the grace of Jesus Christ. And I've experienced that shame. It towers over me and tells me I'm defective. Grace stoops down and tells me that I'm valuable. Shame says because I'm flawed, I'm worthless. Grace says even though I'm flawed, I'm priceless. Shame believes it's the opinion of others that matters. Grace believes it's the opinion of God that matters. Shame leaves me alone and isolated. Grace gives me relationship like no other. Shame makes us hide. Grace sets us free. Shame keeps us down. Grace picks us up. Shame is the language of our accuser, but grace is the language of Jesus. So swim to him, run to him, get to him, get back to him with all that you've got. He's going to take you as he finds you. And his love is going to be too good to leave you there. That's what we see next for Peter. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied, you know that I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know that I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt that Jesus asked this question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything, and you know that I love you. And Jesus said, then feed my sheep. Three times Peter denied Jesus, and now three times he's asked, do you love me? Redemption. Peter cursed Jesus over a charcoal fire and locked eyes with him through the smoke. And now, over another charcoal fire, he's looking through the the smoke into the eyes of the one who is saying to him, your story isn't over yet. And God may have brought you here today to say the same thing. Your story isn't over. Your failure does not define you. Let God's love do that. Peter resurfaced. I mean, obviously, I can't get into the rest of his life, but man, this guy went on to be used by God in amazing ways to be one of the biggest difference makers on the planet for the kingdom of God. And that's because Peter got wrecked by grace. And that is my prayer for every single one of us today, that we would be wrecked by the grace of Jesus Christ. Or listen, wrecked all over again. Because maybe it's been a long time since you've remembered just how bad you need the grace of Jesus Christ. Maybe for someone here to know what he thinks about your failure, he's not mad at you. He's inviting you. Come sit with me. Come experience something different. Come experience relationship. Let me rewrite your story. There's nothing like his love. It's a love without partiality. One that threw out legality despite our morality still suffered brutality. It's a love that extends to our frailty. When our lives were derailed, he posted the bail. He discarded the scale. He himself took the nails. He will not fail me. It's a love that gives us new graces. New life, new freedom, new starts, new embraces from the one who erases, replaces, and leaves no traces of who we once were before he took our places. It's a love in which there is no rejection, no demand for perfection, no judge's objection, but affection, connection, a dead life, resurrection. It's a love so deep, so long, so high. It's a love so steep, so strong, so wide. There is no place in us it cannot fill. No wound in us it cannot seal. No pain in us it cannot heal. It's the love of Jesus Christ who invites you with whatever you've done to come 
and sit with him, your Savior and friend. God, I just pray today for every single one of us, we'd meet you again. We'd meet you again here in this moment. We'd run right into your grace. We'd run right into your invitation. Everything we've thought of you, God, or assumed you've thought of us, God, that we would see how you really respond with love, how you really respond with grace, how you really can rewrite a story. We are forever grateful. And it's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Like I mentioned earlier, we pray that today's service helped you take a step closer to God. We'd love to hear about it and help you continue to move forward in your faith journey. To start that conversation with us, visit parkviewchurch.com slash next steps. Right now, we're going to take communion together. At Parkview, we do this every week as a reminder of all that God has done for us through His Son, Jesus. The writer of Romans says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Knowing that we would all sin and fall short of His expectations on our lives, God made it possible for us to have a relationship with Him. He sent Jesus to cover over all of our mess and all of our mistakes so that when He looks at us, He sees His perfect sons and daughters. That's what we thank God for in this moment. We eat bread and we drink juice to remember Jesus and we thank God for loving us so much that He would send His Son to die for us. We're going to take a minute for a quiet reflection, so now is the perfect time to pause the service and grab some bread or juice or whatever you want to use, and then I'll be back to lead us in communion. The body of Jesus broken for you. Let's eat. The blood of Jesus shed for you. Let's drink. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for loving us so much that you would send your son to cover over all of our sins so we can know you now and forever in heaven. And we're so thankful for that grace because we know we're imperfect, but you love us anyway. And so as we go about our lives, our, our days, our weeks, with our family, our neighbors, our coworkers, um, help us to show that grace to other people and to live lives that are contagious so that other people want to follow your son too. Uh, thank you for him and all that he means for us and the rest of the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, well, thanks again for being here today. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forever. See you next time.